so speaking of which, I guess the first, oh no, it's not, it's not eight yet, so I won't do the first attendance word. Anyway, just to make sure I'm not missing anything, here's the people who are missing. If you have to hear your name on that list, let me know. Wazell, Sims, Valdez, Page, Fisher, Vega, Strickland, Whitaker, Stanley, Newton, Mark, Lubacar, Smith, Carr, and Brevin. Does not seem to be the All right, well, 8 o'clock, we'll get started. Um, first attendance word will be Friday, since it's Friday. Speaking of Friday, three of us have read. If you guys want to, if she wants to, we can take a picture, but she's going to take it for extra, extra, extra credit. If not, I understand. Let's jump into it. Actually, before we jump into it, do you have any questions? I would do announcements, but I have a feeling everybody who's here is well, ahead. well aware of what's going on and probably doesn't need the answers. So anyway, let's talk about osmosis. Osmosis has been known from the lab is pretty simple the way we described it in the lab. It's just the diffusion of water across a semi-permeable membrane. But it's actually a bit more complicated than that, as you're going to see. Good morning, Clark. You missed the first word, it's still, I'll go ahead and give it to you. The first word is Friday. First word for attendance is Friday. Anyway, here we go. Osmosis. Again, here's the more complicated version. More complicated than what we did in lab. Well, the diffusion, or excuse me, the osmosis uh, definition, that's not more complicated. That's just as you learned that it was in lab, which is the diffusion of water across a selectively permeable membrane. And really, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, that's how you need to know it for the exam. But really, when we say selectively permeable membrane, really what we're talking about is the cell membrane, right? Because that's what we care about. This is biology, so we're talking about living things, we're talking about cells. We are concerned about water crossing the cell membrane, um, which the cell membrane is a selectively permeable membrane. But before we move forward, let's make sure you guys understand what that means. First of all, membrane, that part's the easy part, right? That's the thing that's on the outside of a cell. Or, as we did in lab, that stuff you work with, right? That's a membrane. So what does permeable mean? We'll worry about selectively later. What does permeable mean? Any guesses? Yes. Yeah, something that can move through it, right? So it's not like, a, for example, a balloon, right? A regular old balloon, as far as I know, it's not permeable, right? If you blow it up, Air is not going to go through it. Like it might escape a little knot in the Put water in it or any other liquid, nothing's going to come out, right? It's not permeable. Permeable means things can come in and out of it. So then obviously, then we need to add the word selectively. So what do you think that means, selectively permeable? No guesses? Exactly. So just like a cell membrane, any kind of selectable permeable selectively permeable membrane will let some things in and won't let other things in, or in and out, I should say. Just like when we first talked about it yesterday, or uh, Wednesday, when we were talking about active diffusion versus active, passive trans, active diffusion versus uh, passive trans diffusion, I can't wait to speak today. Um, you know, some things can come in spontaneously, some things need energy, some things need a little doorway, like the transport person. So yeah, osmosis is the diffusion of water across a selectively permeable membrane, meaning that membrane will let water in and out, no problem. There's other things that won't let in and out, and that's where it's going to get a little bit more complicated as we move forward. Anyway, to remind you of what we said when we ended um, class on Wednesday, you need to know these words, solute, solvent, and solution. So the solute is the sub substance to be dissolved. Solvent is the liquid that the solute is being dissolved in. And the end product is called the solution. So if I were to take Gatorade powder, Mix it up with some water. The Gatorade powder would be the solute. The water would be the solvent. And the Gatorade drink would be the solution. Any questions about anything on this slide? All right. So I've seen this meme before. I might as well talk about it because I think once you get thinking about osmosis, usually I don't talk about memes. But I'm sure you've seen some version of this. Like, why doesn't osmosis work like this? So this person's asleep, or either that or just really unmotivated, and they've got their head down on them. Thing of books. The idea here is there's a low concentration of knowledge in their head and a high concentration of knowledge in the books, right? So diffusion would say 
things to go with is a high concentration, low concentration. But that's only everything else, right? It's only water when we're talking about osmosis. So I just wanted to throw that out there. I know it's just a meme, it's just a joke, but it's very important to understand when we're talking about osmosis, we're only talking about water. If you download the PowerPoint, you can watch this animation. Here we go. Here's where it gets more complicated. Forget that we're talking about osmosis for a second, all right? Just look at this picture and imagine we are talking about diffusion. Let's say, for example, we're talking about diffusion, so this word's not even there. Selectively permeable is not there. As far as we're concerned, that's just a membrane that'll let any old thing back and forth, all right? You with me? Sort of like that picture you've already seen of diffusion, where there's like a membrane and those little balls are going back and forth. Remember that picture? Imagine this is the same thing. Imagine again, we're talking about diffusion, not osmosis. Um, and for that matter, yeah, there's a sugar molecule, but who cares what that is, right? Um, yeah, and it's lower concentration here, higher concentration here. If we're talking about diffusion, are the little green balls A, going to go right, or B, are they going to go left? We're talking about diffusion. Forget osmosis. We're talking about diffusion. What's going to happen, A or B? B. B is correct, right? Because the balls, the little balls are higher concentration here. They're lower concentration here. So diffusion tells us that nature wants to happen, and these things want to go from here to here until equilibrium is reached, right? At which point, and I'm just making these numbers up, let's say right now, I don't know, let's say that's 10% solution, right? So it's 10% green balls, and let's say this one's, I don't know, 20% green balls. Just throwing some numbers out there, right? So what's going to happen is those balls are going to move until things are equal. And I'm just throwing a number out, just making this up. But they were moved until you hit 15% on one side and 15% on the other. Does that make sense? You guys can see how they would want to move until equilibrium is reached. Equilibrium meaning it would be the same concentration. All right, so that's the fusion. Now let's talk about osmosis. Now let's actually concentrate on the fact that this is a selectively permeable membrane. In this case, this membrane will let water back and forth, but it will not let sugar back and forth. Now, nature still wants to do the same thing. It still wants to go from this 10 on one side and 20 on the other side to 15 and 15. It still wants to equilibrize. We still want to hit equilibrium. So since the balls can't move, what do you think is going to happen? The water is going to move, right? So do you think A, the water is going to move to the right, or B, the water is going to move to the left? Let me ask it a different way. Imagine instead of these things being connected, that was just a cup that was at 10%, and this was just a cup at 20%. And I said, all right, we need to equal these things out. Which water, and, I, and you have some water, and I'm saying pour one in either cup A or cup B. I'm saying pour some water in there because we want these things to be equal. This one's really concentrated, this one's not very concentrated. I want you to pour water into one of those cups to make things equal. Which water, which cup are you going to pour water in, A or B? Water poured in B. To B, right? I hope you guys see that, right? Because that's not very that's not very concentrated. That one is. So obviously, if that one's very concentrated. You're going to put more water into it. So just like if you were making, I don't know, again the Gatorade thing. If you put too much of the powder in there and not enough water, like well, we need to put some more water in there, right? Until it's the right mixture. So that's the same thing that's going to happen here, except instead of you having a cup of pouring water in, nature is going to take place, and the water is going to move from the area where it is high, highly concentrated to low concentrated. But here's where it gets tricky. What's happening is it's moving from an area where the solute is at a low concentration to where the solute is at a high concentration. But if you can just remember, nature's just trying to balance things out, but it should be easy to remember, remember that the water's gonna go from A to B. Does that make sense? It just wants things to be equal. As the water leaves here, it goes here, this number 10 is gonna go up, right? Because the, the concentration is gonna get higher. You have less and less water. And as you get more and more water here, that number's going to go down until finally they both hit number, the random number I threw out there, which is 15%. And that's exactly what happens. So now what we're left with is that one's at 15%. That one's at 15%. Obviously, the one on the right has a lot more water right now. 
but the, the concentration of sugar is still the same, or is, still, is the same now. So again, we went from 10% and 20% solution, and then osmosis did its magic, the water moved, the solute did, and now we're at equilibrium at 15 and 15. So all that makes sense? It's going to be test questions like this, at least one. It won't be about little U shaped uh, thing, but it'll be about balloons and solutions, and there are they are on the uh, study guide. We'll talk about those later. But again, the idea here is that water wants to move to the direction where the solute is really concentrated. And we have words for that. Even though I want to show you this later, I'll go ahead and point it out right now. Hypotonic, that's the one that has less concentration. Hypertonic means it has higher concentration. And isotonic means it's the same concentration. That makes sense? Those important words you will be tested on. And the important thing to note here is if we're talking about hypertonic, hypotonic, isotonic, those are all relative terms. So again, using that Gatorade thing as, as an example. If I were to hold up a glass of Gatorade solution that I just made and say, is this hypotonic, hypertonic, or isotonic? You would say that's a trick question because there's nothing to compare it to, right? Is it more concentrated or less concentrated than what? Right? If you have nothing to compare it to, it can't be that. Like for me, I would assume you guys would call me at least a little tall, right? You might describe me as tall because in this room, I'm taller than you guys, right? It's relevant. You would say, oh, he's the taller person. But if my brother, my younger brother, would come in here, he's 6'9, at which point I would be short and he would be tall. Because it's all relative, right? Same here. This is all relative. But you definitely need to know those terms. And here's how I remember it. When someone says a kid is hyper, what do they mean? High energy, right? They have a lot of energy. So hyper means more, right? So a kid is hyper, has a lot of energy, extra energy, more energy. So if you remember that, then you remember the opposite of that is less. And then as you should know by now, this prefix iso means equal, like isotope, um, isomer, all those words you've already learned. Anyway, so any questions about this? All right, here's those words again. Now they're just in writing for you. Again, we're comparing them to another solution. It's all, it's all relative. Something that's hypotonic, it has, it has a higher concentration of solution. It's hypotonic, it has a lower concentration. It's isotonic. Uh, let's see. The next word for attendance, I'm going to write it instead of saying it this time. I said it earlier. But there it is. There's a second word for attendance for those of you online. Anyway, so is there any questions about these three terms? You might be tested on those terms themselves, the definitions, but more than likely, you're not going to be tested on the, like, the definitions. More than likely, there's going to be questions where those words are used. This thing's hypotonic, this thing's hypotonic. At the end, they're both put in water. Which one's going to be bigger at the end of 15 minutes? So you need to understand those terms. Actually, I'll give you one example. Sorry. Let me give you one example before we move forward. Because this is a very simple example of the test question and the question that's on your table. You have a beaker. Actually, you have two beakers. They both hold the same amount of water. You're going to put a balloon in there that has a, this time it has a semi permeable membrane that lets water in and out and nothing else. This one, I don't know, this one's at 10%. This one's at 20%. You put them both in the water. And after 15 minutes, and 15 is just the number I'm throwing out there, after some time, which one of these balloons is going to be bigger? Balloon A. Or balloon B. Sorry for those of you who are online, who are online and can't see that. Which one's going to be bigger after a set amount of time? Oh, by the way, right now they weigh the same. So, so yes, this one has a 10% solution, that one has a 20% solution, but they have the same weight, they're the same size. Put them in the water. So which one's going to have more water at the end? The one that's hypotonic or the one that's hypertonic? B, yes, because this one such a high, has a higher concentration, so you need more water to go into that balloon to equal things out. 
that make sense? That one's going to require more water to be equal to that one. To calm it down. Yeah, to calm it down. So, okay. yeah. so yeah, you're going to have test questions like that. There's one on the study guide. It's actually a little bit more complicated because there's three of them, but that's the concept, right? The one that has a higher concentration, the one that's hypertonic, that's the one that's going to have the most water coming in because it needs more water to, to even things out. Anyway, let's move forward. Here's where it gets a little bit easier. I think we pretty much got through the hard stuff as far as osmosis is concerned. This is a little easier. Let's talk about uh, water balance in animal cells first. We are animals, so we both like to talk a lot about animals. Also notice that we're talking about animal cells and plant cells. Nothing about fungi or bacteria or protists. So for independent work, you can look that up if you want. How do, the, how do these other creatures handle water balance? Anyway. To survive a hypotonic or hypertonic environment, animal cells have to balance the uptake of loss of water. You don't need to write that down. That's just like an introduction to why we're talking about this. The point here is that animal cells just can't be hanging around willy-nilly, because water can, in fact, pass back and forth through the cell membrane. So the cell needs to be able to control how much water is in there. That's all we're saying right here in this first bullet point. And the word for that control is called osmoregulation. Which makes sense, right? Osmo is regulating the osmosis. It's pretty much that simple. It's the control of the water balance. Here's the thing you need to know for the exam, and I'll show you a picture of it later to remind you. But generally speaking, for animals, they prefer an isotonic environment. So they want to be whatever solute we're talking about. They would prefer to have the same concentration inside as outside, generally speaking. It's going to be, there's a lot of exceptions to that. For the purposes of this discussion, that's what you need to know for the exam. Why is that the case? Because if it was hypertonic, if the cell was in a hypertonic solution, meaning that's not a cell, that's just some, I don't know, there's some box of things in here. And we have a cell here. Let's say the cell is 5%. And the solution that it's in is hypertonic. So it would be anything higher than 5%, right? They call it 15% by now. In that case, you might get a question like this too. I might ask you, where's the water going to go? Is the water going to go from inside the cell to outside the cell? Or from outside the cell to inside the cell? And the answer is the water's going to go from inside the cell to outside, right? Because it wants to even things out. It's highly concentrated out there. It's not in here. So as water leaves the cell, it goes out. That concentration is going to go down, and that concentration is going to go up. That's what's going to happen in nature. So anyway, again, think about this. We're talking about a cell here. So if cells losing water because it's in a hypertonic solution, that's going to dehydrate. And of course, the opposite would be true if, yeah. Come on. There we go. If it was a different situation, and the cell, that's a 15% down, in case you can tell. The cell was in a hypotonic solution. So again, I'm describing the solution outside the cell. <coughs> it's hypotonic, meaning that the concentration is lower on the outside. Now the water's going to want to go in the cell, right? Because it's low concentration on the outside, high concentration on the inside. Water keeps going in. And eventually, just like any kind of water balloon, if you put too much liquid into it, too much water, it's going to blow up. And the word for that, Scientific word for that is lice. I won't test you on that word, but you do know what it means, you know, because it will be used in the exam and study that. So anyway, again, the big thing you need to know for this slide for the exam is you need to know what osmoregulation is. You need to know that plants prefer an isotonic environment. This other stuff. Just to help you remember why plants prefer an isotonic environment. Because if it's hyper, if they're in a hypertonic environment, they're going to dehydrate. If they're in a hypotonic environment, basically blow up. So, any questions about water balance in animal cells? All right. Next, we're going to talk about water balance in plant cells. And we skipped chapter four, so I don't expect anybody to know this, but I'm curious to see if anybody does. What's a big difference between plant cells and animal cells other than chloroplasts? So other than the fact that they photosynthesize and animal cells don't. What's one thing that plant cells have that animal cells don't? Cell wall? Yes, the cell wall. 
we didn't talk much about it. We mentioned it in chapter three when we talked about cellulose, and when I told you that, that cellulose, that's the thing that makes the cell wall. But yes, cell wall, and that's important here, because, well, like we said, so plant cells have rigid cell walls, meaning you can pe keep putting water in there and they won't explode. Like an animal cell will explode, there is no cell wall. But with this cell wall for the plant cell, you keep putting water into it, and it's good to go. Not only will it not explode, but that'll help the plant stay rigid, right? So that's what they prefer, and that's what you need to know for the exam. Animal cells prefer an isotonic environment. Plant cells prefer a hypotonic environment. As I just showed you with the plant cell with the numbers, if it's in a hypotonic environment, water is going to want to come in. So again, at the outside, it's 5% solution, whatever, whatever that solution may be, salt, uh, sugar, doesn't matter. And the cell has 15% solution. The water is going to want to come in to equalize things. That's a hypotonic environment. That's what plant cells prefer. Now you know why, and that's what you need to know for the exam. They prefer a hypotonic environment. Now, isotonic is not that bad. In an isotonic environment, it's still living, but the cell's not rigid. You ever seen a plant that's all floppy because it hasn't been watered? That's what that is at first. And then eventually, though, if you don't water it long enough, then it becomes hypertonic, where all the water's gone and it's just dead. Hypertonic will kill it. Isotonics, it's okay. Hypertonics would have prefers. And again, hypotonic being the preference is what you need to know for the exam. So as I was saying earlier, here's a picture of what I'm saying. This thing's a little bit dehydrated. It's not dead yet necessarily, but the cells don't have enough water coming in, so they're not rigid. And so think about that. The thing that makes the difference between this and this is simply the water. Having the cells filled with water, that's it. So it's making that happen. Anyway, you don't necessarily need to know this for the exam. You don't need to know what happens when the cells, plant cells don't have enough water. This is just to help you remember what you do need to know for the exam, which is that plant cells prefer a hyper, hypotonic environment because they want water coming in. Any questions? All right. Next word for attendance then is going to be plant. We're talking about it. I need to find my video. Back when iPhones, there was a while back when iPhones didn't used to have the stop motion thing. You guys know what I'm talking about where you can like record an hour of somebody playing sports and then it's like a 30 second clip and it just shows people buzzing around. Well, I've done that with my plant because my wife doesn't exactly do good at watering plants. So uh, one day I came home and my plant looked that, looked like that. So I did that thing and I recorded it for I don't know, four hours. I watered it, recorded it for four hours. So then you watch the clip and like 30 seconds later it goes from this to this. That was pretty neat. If I can find it, I'll share it with you. But I don't know where it is. Anyway, this next slide just basically shows you what you need to know for the exam all in one picture. Again, animals prefer this isotonic environment. Right? Animals prefer isotonic, and you can see why, because in that picture it's normal. And again, plants prefer a hypotonic environment. You can see right there why. And neither one of them like to be in a hypertonic. Here's another question you can look up, and this is a really complicated thing for independent work, because it depends on the species. But generally speaking, <clears throat> what happens if you put a freshwater fish in the saltwater? What happens if you put a saltwater fish in the freshwater? Something to think about. I think about that a lot, especially with like the Noah's Ark thing. Like, how do they survive 40 days in the wrong, you know, the wrong concentration of water? Anyway. Any questions about this? All right, now let's talk about something else. We're done talking about osmosis. I don't like how your book does it in this um, order. In my opinion, we should have already talked about active transport after we talked about passive transport. But no, we're going to talk about active transport now. So now we're going back to something. Well, it's not like diffusion. It's kind of the opposite of diffusion. Active transport. I brought this up when we talked about passive transport because I said it's basically the opposite of passive transport. Now, well, active transport requires energy, unlike passive transport. Passive transport is simply diffusion, right? It goes from very high concentration to low concentration. You don't have to put in energy for that. It just does it naturally. Active transport does require an input of energy. 
Your book points out that the energy it usually uses is ATP. You don't need to know that for the exam, which is why I didn't even write it on there. I just wanted to throw it out there. And also, just so you know, there are other types of energy other than ATP, but we keep things simple here and focus on ATP. Another thing is that it requires a transport protein. If you remember passive transport, not always, it didn't always require a transport protein. If the molecule could get through the, the cell membrane, there was no need for a transport protein. Sometimes for passive transport, it could not get through the, the uh, cell membrane, so you would have a transport protein, and that was called facilitated diffusion. But always with active transport, it always requires a transport protein. Here's the other way that it's the opposite of passive transport, is we are going against the concentration gradient. Passive transport, you're going with it. Passive transport, you're going from high concentration to low concentration. Active transport, you're going against, meaning you're going from low concentration to high concentration, right? Which is what, that's against what nature wants, so to speak, which is why you, why it requires an input of energy. Why did they, did they do this? I'm going to put an X to this. I'm not going to ask you why. It's just for your own knowledge. It's so that the plants can maintain a concentration of small solutes that differ from the environmental concentrations. So, I don't know. We just talked about sucrose when I showed you those green balls in the tube, right? So maybe, you, maybe your cells want a bunch of sucrose in there, and there's hardly any sucrose in your blood. Well, they're still going to pump them in, right? They still need the solutes. Otherwise, it would go the other way around. Anyway, any questions so far about what active transport is? So active transport can involve the transport of ions? Yes. Yes, it can. Okay. Yeah. It can involve, yeah, because an ion could be a solute. So for example, salt, right? You put salt, you have salt in you, which you do. You have sodium and chloride, those are the ions. And yes, those can definitely get moved. Which brings me to this next one. Speaking of which, it is a sodium, right? You have sodium in you from, that's a solute. Anyway, if you download this PowerPoint, you can see this active transport in action. See the sodium potassium pump in action. It's got a lot of details that you don't necessarily need to know for the exam, but it's there if you want to watch it. Here is a good drawing of what we're talking about. Whatever these little golden balls are, your cell wants more of them. And there's hardly any of them in, you know, in the, on the outside of the cell. But again, your cell wants more of them, so it spins energy to pump them in. Now this is a very important concept. Even though it's simple, it's very important. Once we start talking about photosynthesis and res respiration, it's going to be very important that you understand this concept, which is that it requires energy to pump some things into your cell. Right? And then let's forget for a second that we're talking about um, active transport. Forget that for a second. Here we have something in high concentration. They would have something in low concentration, right? Forget that we're talking about active transport. What do we know wants to happen? Where do these balls want to go? Do the balls want to go that way? Do they want to go up or do they want to go down? Again, forget. Just think about diffusion. Where do the balls want to go? Up or down? They want to go up, right? Or more specifically, they want to go out. This is the inside of the cell. They want to leave the cell, right? It's low concentration here, high concentration here. So we know nature wants, diffusion wants these things to go from here to here. Of course, we're not using active transport to do the opposite. That will be important when we talk about photosynthesis and respiration. Anyway, there's the picture, right? Just pumping them in. The cell needs more of these golden balls, whatever they are. So they're just pumping them in. They're spending energy to pump those things in. So any questions about that? All right, here's the next concept. The last concept of the chapter. It's a very, very easy one. Uh, there's not many questions about it on the study guide, and there probably won't be any questions about it on the exam, but let's talk about it anyway. Exocytosis and endocytosis. So basically, we're not talking about moving little things in and out of the cell. Now we're talking about the trafficking of large molecules, or a bunch of molecules, however you want to look at it. So basically, we're talking about things coming in and out of the cell. First thing we're going to talk about is exocytosis. If you had to guess, do you think exocytosis is things coming into the cell or things going out of the cell? Based on that name. Yeah, exo, right? It just sounds like it's exiting. So yeah, exocytosis is the movement of materials out of the cell. If anything, that's what you need to know for the exam. 
The book does get a little bit more specific. It mentions how it happens. It happens through these membranous vesicles or vacuoles that fuse with the plasma membrane. You don't necessarily need to know that. But imagine your cell is this big blob with a plasma membrane around it. Well, on the inside, there's also little blobs that have little plasma membranes around them. So what happens is, if you're trying to export these purple balls in this case, that plasma membrane fuses with the main plasma membrane until it all becomes one, and then boom, out come the purple balls. It's that simple. Now I'll just go ahead and underline the part that you need to know again. is the movement of materials out of the cell. And you can see, those little purple balls are not necessarily large molecules. So like I said, even though the book said it's the movement of large molecules, sometimes it's also just the movement of a lot. Right? So it's like, we gotta get a lot of these things out of here. So let's do this. Because we don't have time to wait for diffusion. We don't have time to wait for facilitated diffusion. We've got to hurry the process up. So any questions about exocytosis? Well, the opposite of that is endocytosis. And that's just when things are coming in. And even that sounds like what it is. Endo, sounds like it's coming in. Endo, of course it's spelled different, but yeah. It's when the cell takes in materials, again, via vesicles. So when you think about it, it's really just the opposite of um, exocytosis. Because remember the picture of exocytosis was the same, except the arrows were pointed in a different direction and they were purple balls, right? So this thing merged with this and then everything left. Now it's just the opposite comes in, kind of bloods inward until it has its own little ball, and then bloop, it comes in. It's that simple. There are two other little concepts that you might need to know for the exam. A question mark. Probably do right there. I don't know if I'm going to get this detailed. But the endocytosis itself is broken down into two categories. There's phagocytosis, which is basically cellular eating. In which case, the cell is basically bringing in food, right? Or better thing to think about is solid stuff. When the cell brings in solid stuff, it's phagocytosis. Phagocytosis, I've heard it pronounced different ways. And the opposite, well not the opposite, but when it's bringing in liquids, that's called pinocytosis, which is basically cellular drinking. And if I remember correctly, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but for some reason, I think your book talks about phagocytosis, but it doesn't talk about phenocytosis, which I think is weird, because if you mention one, you need a bunch of both. Who knows what Pinot Grigio or Pinot Noir are? It's wine. Yes, wines, right? So that's how I always remembered this when I was a student. I was like, all right, Pinot. Pinot, that's a wine, you drink that. And then therefore, by a process of elimination, the other one was the eating. So I could remember that one was drinking because of wine. And I remember the other one was eating because of uh, uh, process of elimination. So that'll be the next word for attendance. Why not, since we're talking about it. Wine. Okay. That's another, that's an interesting independent work topic if you're into wine. What is it about growing grapes in certain regions gives it that certain taste? I don't know if you know much about wine, but generally the name of them are, refers to the grape. So Pinot Noir versus the Pinot Grigio, that's because there's different grapes. But if we're talking about a Pinot Noir from California versus a Pinot Noir from France, it's supposed to be different. Um, and the reason, well, there's some biological reasons. You can look it up if you want. Anyway, any questions about endocytosis? If you download the PowerPoint, you can watch this little video that shows pinocytosis in action. Um, again, at the end of every chapter, we have this thing called evolution connection, where it ties that, the, the concepts of that chapter into evolution. As always, we're going to skip it. As always, I recommend reading it and letting me know if you have questions about it. You might get questioned about it on the study guide. I don't remember, but that is it. So we are done early. That's awesome. So if you want to do the thing, you guys want to do the picture? Can you take it? All right. Let me quit recording and we will do the picture. I will be online for office hours today. Online only because I have to go to a meeting. So I'm going to be doing that meeting while I'm online for office hours. Double tasking. Multitasking.